everyone and welcome to Geotab's Wildcard Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, my name is Shay Green and I'm a Sales Enablement Manager here at Geotab. For today's session, we'll be hearing from Hillary Becker, our Customer Success Team Lead, and Kyle Dodsworth, our Solutions Specialist Team Lead, as they go over the latest updates from My Geotab and Geotab Drive. And with that being said, I'm going to hand things over to Hillary to kick us off. Hello and welcome to the 2003 Release Notes Wildcard Wednesday. Uh, as Shay mentioned, my name is Hillary Becker and I am the Customer Success Team Lead. I will be starting the presentation with the My Geotab updates and later I will hand it over to Kyle for the Geotab Drive updates. There are a number of updates on the My Geotab side this time, so I'm just going to dig right in. As always, a friendly reminder to check your current version, navigate in the database to administration, about, and check your build number. End of life notice. As I mentioned last time, as of this release, we will no longer support Internet Explorer 10. This follows the notice Microsoft announced earlier this year where they ended support for Internet Explorer 10 and older. Replacing devices just got easier. For eligible devices, for a free upgrade, you can now request replacements directly from your My Geotab database. Eligible devices will be highlighted in My Geotab. Resellers are promptly notified and can take action immediately. This functionality will be used to help you prepare for the upcoming 3G sunset. A better way to send messages. Please note this is a feature preview. Stay connected with your drivers using the new consolidated messaging feature. Threaded views provide conversation style messages with simple to use input controls such as adding links and canned replies. Messages can be sent to devices for anyone driving the vehicle to see or directly to users for private two-way communication. Unread messages display in tab titles for easy detection or as shortcuts under notifications on the main title bar. Messages can be searched using date and display filters for accurate and friendly searches. Please note, uh, direct messages to from the drivers will be available in the upcoming 2004 release. Groups. Sometimes small changes lead to big benefits. When filtering multiple groups at a time, using the word and can be confused with using the operator and, potentially leading to unintended results. For example, you want to see the vehicles that belong to two groups simultaneously, the Heavy Duty Group and the Las Vegas Group. This is not possible today. Instead, you see all the vehicles in the Heavy Duty Group and all the vehicles in the Las Vegas Group. To improve the accuracy of filter results, we change the word and to the word or. Note, in the future, we will be supporting the and operator, and there are a number of other cool group functionality improvements in the works, so stay tuned. Geotab introduced a new sustainability pillar at Connect 2020. To help fleets reduce their carbon footprint, we added a new sustainability section to the rules page. FYI, this is currently in feature preview, so make sure it's turned on to see it. You can find the idling and fleet idling rules in this section, as well as electric vehicle or EV rules, further supporting the successful adoption of EVs. Here are the four EV rules. First rule, EV low charge. Get notified when an EV becomes at risk of not having sufficient charge to complete routes without stopping to charge. Next rule, EV enters charging location with low charge. So when an EV returns to a lot or a depot with sufficiently low charge, uh, it's time to plug in. This rule is useful for plug-in reminders and identifying which EVs need to be prioritized for charging. Uh, third rule, EV exits charging location with low charge. This is useful for identifying EVs leaving for the workday, which are at risk of not having sufficient charge to complete the day without a charging stop, or they're leaving an area with close proximity to charging facilities and are now at risk of not having sufficient range to return to charge. And the fourth rule is EV done charging. Get notified when it's time to unplug or the EV is now ready to go. When there are more EVs than plugs, this will help to identify which EVs are done charging and their plug can be given to the next EV. New privacy options in system settings. 
GeoTab has added a new Privacy Settings tab where users can choose to exclude information that might be considered sensitive from email, web, and text notifications for exception event alerts. There's a new filter option added to the Zones page. Zones can now be filtered by active status as well as by zone type. Engine faults improvements. To eliminate confusion between telematics, device firmware updates, and ECM firmware updates, we've updated the message text on the engine faults page to telematics device colon firmware update applied successfully. Did you know that dismissing a fault does not clear it from the vehicle, it simply clears it from the application? To better explain this, we have improved and updated the message text so you know exactly what's happening before you proceed. Diagnostic trouble codes, known as DTCs, are now available on the engine fault page. For a better experience, the engine faults page has been improved to include more information with less downloading. DTCs and their descriptions are now displayed directly on the page. Also, proprietary faults now display, replacing the previous description of quote unquote unknown faults. MyGeotep supports a wide range of engine diagnostics, and we've just added more. You can now filter diagnostics from GMCC, C, BRP, and OBD with source address information. For more clarity on the engine fault reports, we've renamed OBDSA to OBD with source address information. OBDSA is easily mistaken for OBD South Africa, and we want to make sure our labels are as descriptive and reader friendly as possible. To minimize the time it takes to set up a new database, resellers and customers can now import the template of their choice when creating a new database. Using the Advanced Settings option on the registration page, simply choose your file to automatically apply settings to the new database. As we continue to make our platform more global friendly, we've added another language to MyGeotab. The application is now available in Thai. If the time zone on your computer is different from the time zone in your user options, we've added a convenient message to remind you to adjust them if needed. We have also made a number of smaller general improvements such as bug and security fixes, some improvements, um, we added a show password button to the add user page. When a vehicle is archived, my GeoTab will now automatically unassign any driver associated with that vehicle. And zone import files now have a limit of 10 megabytes. A 10 megabyte file includes approximately 250,000 to 300,000 rows. We have increased the efficiency of API calls. This is especially noticeable on API calls with large response payload. For example, calling git feed of status data with a full payload, which is roughly 50,000 results. The average end-to-end -end time decreased from 1,800 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds. The list of API calls with updates is listed here. Check out all of the updates on the SDK What's New page. That's it from the MyGeotab side, handing it over to Kyle for the GeoTab Drive updates. Perfect. Thanks, Hilary. So we do have quite a few changes inside of GeoTab Drive for this release. So we're going to go through them now. So just for some general improvements first, we want to talk about something that we had in feature preview last release that is now available uh, widespread. Um, and that's the availability notification during the workflow of logging in. If you had feature preview on in the 2002 release, you would have seen this. Now it will be available to everybody without feature preview on. Uh, what this feature does is it actually lets the driver know if they're running low on availability before they go through the full workflow of logging in. So it actually interrupts the login before the DBIR, and it's to make sure that the driver can go and actually change anything that they may need to change to update availability before they start their day. So in these two examples here, it's showing me that I have no availability left, 
and I have limited availability left. In the case where you have no availability left, you can actually tap inside of that violation risk banner and it brings you directly to your log so that you can go and modify what you might need to. And a lot of times it's because you forgot to log out the day before or you're still on duty overnight and you don't have any availability because of that. It's just a way to make sure that the driver can get a snapshot of their availability before they get all the way into the system. The other time that it might pop up as well is from another feature that we added in the previous releases called the exempt HOS exemption. That's for those drivers who are starting their day, maybe have to do a DVIR, but they're going to use the agriculture exemption for the whole day. So exempt HOS is one of those cases where you would use it. You can apply exempt HOS directly from this little availability window so that that way you're on that special exemption before you actually get all the way into the system. So it's uh, two ways to save time. Inside of the system settings, we have added a field for database name. So now it will show your company information and also the database name. This is mainly for supporting the actual customer. If they were to call into the Geotab support line, uh, we do usually need to know the database name and drivers a lot of times wouldn't, wouldn't know it. So now they can just go into the system settings and uh, get that database name and our support team will obviously be able to guide them into that section if they don't know how to get there. It's just gonna be a lot easier for us to verify uh, which database we should be looking at so we can help that person who called in. Another thing on sort of the feedback and help side is inside of the message text for driver feedback. So inside of settings, you can also send feedback into Geotab about what you're seeing on the screen. So for better clarity, we just wanted to put some more information there that this is sending information back to Geotab about an issue or a feature request that you might have in mind. We don't want you to use this as the actual support for something that's going wrong with your logs, like you forgot to use personal conveyance or something like that. We want to make sure that the drivers knew that this was going to Geotab, and if they have something specific that they need to help with, make sure to go to their administrator or their support team, uh, because this section here isn't going to, to them. It, it actually comes to, to Geotab instead. We've also improved the message for the interactive prompts that you see throughout the different parts of the system. So inside of the messages that say, hey, you've got missing locations, you've got unverified logs, or you're in violation, it actually will now say tap here for more details or tap here for review, uh, just to make sure that drivers know that they can actually tap that and be brought directly into that particular log that is maybe causing the violation, so that drive log, or tapping to be brought directly into that log that needs verification or that missing information. So just a little bit more help to make sure the driver knows that they can easily jump to whatever's causing that particular message just by tapping that particular message. So in the previous release in 2002, we added the camera picture feature onto DVIRs. Now that it's been rolled out, we do want to announce that it is only available for devices that are on the Pro and the Pro Plus plans. Another quick improvement, the HOS exemption, the one that I mentioned earlier where you can use it for things like agriculture, we have made a, a small tweak that you can't duplicate names in the system using that exemption, just to make sure that if someone tried to create another off-duty status, uh, we didn't want that exemption to be able to be named the same as one of our regular statuses. So uh, there's now validation to make sure that if you are going to rename that HOS exemption to something unique for your particular business, like agriculture, it will just check to make sure that it's not infringing on another name that's already used by another status or exemption. On that note as well, there will be more information available on our blog shortly about the HOS exemption, its use cases, and things like that. It is something that a lot of people will probably want to use, especially in the agriculture or utility space, um, and there's more use case and information coming soon about that. Uh, there's also improved text-to-speech behavior. So we've basically reduced the amount of talking that the system's actually going to do. So before, if you had a violation of multiple types, it would actually specify every single one. So if anyone had ever, let's say, stayed on duty by accident for a couple of days and ran out of both cycle time and duty time, the system's going to yell at you and tell you all of those <laughs> different violations. And it's pretty loud and it's a lot of talking. So now if you have multiple upcoming violations, it will just say 
upcoming violations and not actually speak each and every one of them as well is it will only read out how much time is remaining in the workday instead of going through the whole entire process and it's also read aloud for the violation if the app is running in the background or when the lock screen is activated so it's it's not going to pop up otherwise there's a slight improvement for anyone using IOX USB for that data transfer, which is useful when you do not have uh, the cloud. Now, when you unplug the IOX USB, it will only alert you that you've unplugged if we don't have network coverage. So if you're using it purely for power um, and you still have network coverage, when you unplug the device, it won't tell you anything. Uh, in those cases, we know that you're just using it for power, so we don't need to a uh, warning. But if you are using it specifically because you're in areas of no coverage and you're relying on that data transfer through the cable and you unplug, we do just want to make sure that there's a little notice to make sure that the driver knows that, uh, that you should plug back in before driving again. There's also a slight change to the log out workflow. So if you are on a different status than off when you go through the, the, the workflow to log off, the last screen it actually asks you is if you want to change a new status. If you've been doing that recently, and, and by recently I mean basically since we've had the system, the next time you log in in the morning, you'd notice that you have to verify that off-duty log that you just created when you logged out last. And that does make sense because the verify piece was always done before this off-duty screen that we're showing on the screen here. Now, when you choose a new status, we've, we're actually gonna verify and log you out at the same time. So we're gonna re-verify just that off-duty that you created and then log you out. That way, when you log in the next time, it won't have that single off-duty waiting for you to verify. A very small, it's a small piece, but it's something that we wanted to add to save time on the login and the logout. This is to do with clock in and clock out, a feature that we made available in feature preview uh, last release. It is now something that's hidden behind custom code. So it's not available by default inside of that feature preview uh, piece. So if you do want to utilize it, make sure to let us know at eld.geotab.com and we'll be able to walk you through how to re-enable it. It is something that can be uh, enabled in those 2002 releases and the 2003 release using uh, custom code. And uh, the reason we wanted to do this was to make the UI a little bit cleaner and we'll have a new version um, with a, a slightly different UI coming soon uh, that's a little less intrusive. But if you do like the way that it works, so the way that it was in Feature Preview, uh, just let us know and we can re-enable it for you um, in the meantime. So that's the general improvements, and now we want to work into Canadian DVIR. So Canadian DVIR or Canadian Trip Inspections uh, is something that we've supported in beta mode and we've just been adding more things to it to bring it up to par um, and eventually take it out of beta. So Canadian trip inspections are similar to what you would do in the US, but there are some big changes and big uh, workflow pieces that are optional that you don't have the ability to use in a US DVIR. The first thing that we wanted to change is based on the vehicle's license plate, state or province, we're going to show the right type of DVIR to them. So what that means is that if you have a vehicle that has a state uh, level uh, license plate, so you're from New York, even if you're in Canada, it's still going to show you the DVIR that you would do for the US rules. There is a harmonization uh, between uh, both Mexico, US and Canada that states that if you are a plated vehicle from the US, you can do a US DVIR no matter where you are. Vice versa, if you're a plated vehicle from Canada, you would do your uh, provincial type of DVIR even if you were in the US. Now, the state and province uh, license plate, that's something that is optional. You don't have to fill it out for any reason in the ELD world. So if you don't have that filled out on your vehicles, that's okay. What we'll do is just use the location that the vehicle is in at that exact moment, and we'll use that type of DVIR. So if you're driving around um, in New York, you're gonna be doing DVIRs um, for the US style, and as soon as you cross the border and the next morning do a DVIR, you'll see the Canadian. Still perfectly legal. You'll just notice there's a few new fields available when you're in that Canadian version. 
So those three new fields that we have available are hubometer for trailer inspections. Alberta requires that, which is why it's on the form now. And then height of load and width of load is also there for um, all inspections in Canada. And that's because Manitoba requires that. So we want to make sure to include that. If you know that you don't need to fill those out, they are optional, so you don't have to fill them out. But if you are doing DVIRs in Manitoba or Alberta, you would probably uh, recognize these because those are fields that would have been on the old paper forms. The other big change in the workflow piece that we've added into uh, this uh, Canadian DVIR is an inspector role. So there is a piece of the Canadian rules in the NSC 13 that basically says that your driver doesn't have to be the one to do the actual inspection. You could have someone else inspect the vehicle and as long as the driver signs off on that inspection, that's perfectly fine. So. For now, we're hiding this behind custom code. So if you don't need to use it, you don't have to do anything. But if you do use this particular inspector mechanism, the custom code is listed there on the screen. And what it will do is inside of your DVIR, underneath the inspection type, will actually ask whether you're a driver or an inspector. Now, the rest of these the slides I'm gonna talk about are talking about the inspector pieces. So if you haven't put in this custom code and you don't use the inspector side, some of the next slide is not gonna be relevant. But if you have enabled the inspector piece, we want to kind of talk a little bit about how that works because it's a different type of workflow than usual. So if you have an inspector doing the inspection, when the driver comes in and logs in, picks that vehicle, there's a little compliance message and it's gonna prompt the driver to accept or reject that inspection that was done by the inspector. So before you can do the repair and certify workflow, you have to accept or reject that inspection. Now, if the driver rejects the inspection, the inspector, it's just basically gone. You're, we're gonna, we're gonna remove that and you're gonna have your driver do a brand new inspection. Now, the inspector also receives a compliance prompt and they themselves can accept and reject the inspection. And that's so if an inspector finds something during a DVIR in the morning, they can then pull that vehicle out, put it into the garage, and then accept their own DVIR to then do a repair. Now, again, this is just here so that you don't get stuck in between this inspection screen. Again, it's completely optional. You have to have the custom code enabled in order to use this new workflow. If you do add this custom code and use the workflow. Let us know your thoughts on that feedback. Again, this is a, a beta product. So we do want to see if there's uh, people who are using it and giving us some good feedback on any kind of issues that they might have uh, as we work towards uh, taking this out of beta and giving it to everybody for those Canadian DBIRs. A little wrap up on this, because there are brand new fields and brand new workflow, we have added or renamed some of the fields inside of the DVIR form. So we have no major or minor defects, that's renamed from no, no defects in the US. Carrier address, that's company address in the US. Carrier name is company name in the US. Hubometer is there for trailers, that's one of the new fields. Name of inspector, name of operator, those are the new fields based on the new workflow. And then height and width of load for Manitoba. Uh, VIN is also added as well. And then inspection type, the pre, in, or post trip is now moved closer to the bottom of the screen. We've also added something for Canada where minor defects can be carried forward for Canadian DVIRs. So for DVIRs that are done in Canada, the app treats minor defects the same way as it treats unregulated defects. So it basically allows those defects to be carried forward from one DVR to the next without marking them as repaired or not necessary. So you can leave them as unchecked and they'll automatically appear on the next DVIR. So that's a little bit different than how it works in the US because the Canadian rules are, are different. Again, another change for uh, the Canadian rules is when you add a defect to a previously reported DVIR and you mark a date for that, we want to make sure that that wasn't the only DVIR that we show to inspectors. So for anyone who's been driving around in Canada, they know that they have to be able to show the DVIR to an inspector, unlike the US. But in these cases where you have something that happens in the middle of the day, so a driver's driving along and they have a tire blowout, but they get it fixed by the middle of the day, they'll do another DVIR to show that fix. 
Well, we wanted to make sure that we could show both the pre-trip DVIR and that DVIR that they did in the middle of the day to an officer. We didn't want to just default show the most recent because then they'd have some driving time there and we didn't want to have any ambiguous data there to show that the driver didn't do a pre-trip. So all that basically means is that now when you go into the inspection mode, if you've done any in-trip DVIRs, it's going to show that alongside the pre-trip that you did as well. That's to make sure that we can show more than one DVIR just to give a better picture to the officer. And again, this is for Canada only because in the US, you wouldn't be showing that screen. Keep in mind though, you can have access to that screen and you do have access to that screen in the US. You just don't need to show DVIRs by law to officers in the US. A note on languages for the Drive app as well, specifically to uh, Drive app add-ins. So we can now have all of our supported languages available inside of add-ins. For now, there's more information about this inside of the GitHub repository for any of our developer friends, uh, but this means that going forward, we can actually start translating our add-ins and we'll start doing that on uh, the ones that we have created. But if you have your own add-ins and you'd like to add translation, head over to that GitHub re repository for more information on translation. A note on SDK updates specifically for Drive. There's new parameters for the text message search. So text messaging is something that we've been working on making better. So there's now uh, three new options available um, inside of the text message search options. Because of all the changes to the DVIR piece, we have all of those changes inside of the DVIR log object as well. So now you can find authority address, authority name, the hubometer, the load height, the load width, and the inspected by, by driver or not, available inside of the DVIR log. One thing to note though, the reports inside of my GeoTab won't necessarily reflect all of these changes for Canadian DVIR yet, but they are inside of the API. Now, this slide isn't specific to uh, the 2003 release. This is actually something that's specific for both 2002 and 2003 that we wanted to talk about since we're getting closer to the September 29th date for the hours of service final rule and the changes that are coming at the end of September. So we do have a blog that outlines all of this, but I wanted to talk about it again. Uh, the four big changes that are coming into force at the end of September from the FMCSA. Uh, one, revolving around how you take your breaks and the required breaks. So before, a driver had to take 30 minutes in the off-duty or sleeper berth after eight hours of workday, no matter what happened between the start of their workday and that eight-hour mark. After these changes, you can now do that 30 minutes in any status that's not driving. So it could be on, it could be off, and it's only required after you do eight hours of driving. So a lot of drivers will probably meet this requirement without doing anything special whatsoever. They're gonna be waiting for loads or fueling. All of those things that, was, that were on duty that couldn't meet your break beforehand, well, they will. That's, that's one of the biggest changes, probably the one that most people really wanted inside of this, uh, this final rule. And that's something that we wanted to highlight. The next big one was all about sleeper birth. So before you have to do eight and two combinations or two eights, one of the two. And the two hours that you spent inside of your sleeper berth or your off duty, that counted towards your work day. The eight hours, that, that didn't. Well now you can do an eight two like you did before, but you can also do a seven three. So the FMCSA is giving a slightly more flexible option in this case. And most importantly, neither part, either the eight hour or the two hour or the seven or the three, none of those parts count towards your work day. So you actually get a little bit more time to work in between the parts of your sleeper burst split. So that's a, another pretty big change. Most people who are familiar and using the sleeper berth probably are, are really happy about this. If you haven't used sleeper birth a lot, it will take a little bit more to kind of understand how sleeper birth works with these new rules. But the bottom line is you get more work day to work in between the breaks that you're taking. Adverse driving also got a tweak as well. So before, when you press adverse driving, you got two more hours to drive. But that didn't really help if you couldn't really do anything while you're stuck in behind a mudslide. So now, when you use adverse driving, you get driving time and work day time as well. So it extends your day out uh, by two hours or on the passenger side, it gives you two hours more of duty to work. So 
that gives you much more flexibility, makes it actually easier to use those two hours of driving to get your job done or get to a safe place off the highway. And then finally, there was also a tweak to the short haul exemption as well. So not only can you now use it if you are 150 air miles away from your home terminal, you also get 14 hours of a workday, just like anyone on the long haul, which harmonizes and gets rid of the need of a whole bunch of other exemptions like the non-CDL and so forth. So 14 hours of consecutive workday will be available on the short haul exemptions. All four of these take effect on the 29th of September. Unless there is something that happens to change that, which we have not heard of anything coming down the pipeline that could possibly derail it, our system is ready to go on the 29th. So on September 29th, 2020, all relevant geotab rule sets will automatically reflect those changes. So if you're currently on a USA property rule set or USA passenger rule set, or the property short haul 12 hour workday rule set with any of the cycles or any restart options, when you wake up on the 29th, you'll automatically have these rules already applying. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to update your app. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to change anything. They're actually already baked into the system with a go live of the 29th. So it's gonna happen automatically. The only caveat to this is that sleeper birth provision. It's way more flexible than it used to be. So if you do use sleeper birth, and if your drivers use sleeper birth a lot, I want to make sure that everyone subscribes to our blog where we talked about this when it first came out back in June, because we'll be updating that with any final details or changes that we might have to make um, in early September, about 30 days before the actual uh, 29th go live. The reason why I want to put that caveat out there is, is simply because we may need to have a few more button clicks done by drivers when they use the sleeper berth. Because it's so flexible now, we want to make sure that if a driver is using sleeper berth, we get the availability right. And we might need to, to get some information from the driver about what exactly their intentions are if they're going to be doing one of these new 7-3 splits or switching between 8s and 2s and 7s and 3s. So if there is anything that the driver has to change or update or do, we will make sure to update within 30 days of that change um, on the 29th. But if you don't use sleeper berth, you don't have to do anything or worry about anything. You won't notice anything except more availability on the 29th because these new rules give you more availability and we're all ready to go. So we can hand it back to Shay to see what type of questions we had. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Um, the first question that we have for you here is, how does the database import template get created? I can probably handle that from a solutions engineering perspective. I, I'm not sure if we talked about that a lot in this presentation, but uh, the database import tool is actually deprecated, so it, it's not actually something that we would suggest using on a regular basis. That one, I would probably defer to reach out to your account manager or support member to get more information on options there. All righty, next question that we've got for you guys is, when did or will the exempt hours of service get added? Looking to set it up as the agricultural exemption and stop using personal conveyance. It's already there. It was there in 2002. All right, perfect. Next question that we've got for you is, outside of this session and the blog post, are there any other communication set up for feature improvements and functionality changes in Drive uh, to communicate to the end user accounts? No, this is how we, we actually do those communications. The final rule changes on the 29th being a special case because they have a specific go live. It's really one of the only times that we will have ever had the requirement to make a change on a specific day, which then forces us to have a different type of communication plan. Normally, the what's new will list all of the changes, especially if there's anything UI-based. Any any UI-based change, so user interface change, um, has to go into the what's new and, and go into a actual release build, so the 2002 or the 2003 updates that happen otherwise, because you'll know that you'll see that there are updates usually weekly into databases. Those patches are just fixes for things that have broken or need tweaks on the on the back end that, that fix features that are already in place. The patches that happen during the week uh, will never introduce new functionality. New functionality can only be done through the big releases like we're talking about here. 
Alrighty, next question that we have is, it looks like there's some technical issues with the text-to-speech working correctly on iOS. Is there a fix planned for that? Yes, this is already a known issue. The development is working on it. Alrighty, next question for you guys. With regards to the cool new privacy exclude data option, could the driver name captured from the Geotab Drive app be a parameter that could be defined as being excluded from being presented on the website? I'm not sure of that exact answer, but I would be happy to take that back and I will email you an answer after the presentation. Awesome, thanks so much, Hillary. Next question that we have for you guys is, for the ad adverse driving condition, is it still only able to be used once per cycle? You can use it every day. It's not cycle-based. So you can use it every, every day. That's the use case. Alrighty, next question we have for you is, when choosing a vehicle when you're logging into Geotab Drive, will Geotab eventually show which vehicles are available? I'm not sure we know exactly what we're referring to. Because the vehicle list will be available to you, like whatever grouping you have, that defines what vehicles you can see in the list. The ones that are closest to you are the ones that pre-populate, but you can type in the description of the vehicle and find all vehicles that are within your data scope. So I'm not sure exactly what the what available means in this context. All right, perfect. I'm sure we'll get a follow-up on that one. But in the meantime, the next question that we have is, when driver one has done a pre-trip and driven the vehicle to the destination, and now driver two will take the vehicle, why does the system ask driver two to certify and review and not allow driver two to do a new vehicle inspection? So that comes down to the way the workflow works. In the US, the rule is that a driver has to sort of like review and certify any DVIRs that were done uh, prior that had defects. Just as a point of simplicity, instead of forcing the system to check to see if there were defects, we just have that certify step on every DVIR by default. That way, no matter what happens, the driver would always start by certifying the previous DVIR, whether there are defects or not. It's simply a, a ease of use and a way to make sure the workflow is the exact same every time a driver starts an, a new DVIR. That's the main reason why it's there. But if there happen to be defects on the previous DVIR that were repaired, the certify step is actually there for a legal reason because it's part of the actual law. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Um, the next question that we have is actually a clarification on the previous question for the available vehicles specifically vehicles that are available to the driver so they can select one which are not currently being driven. That would be a feature request item, I, I suppose. Not something that we've had asked before. Perfect, uh, we'll take that one offline as well for you. Um, next question we have here is, will there be any pop-up notifications to the driver in the Drive app for the September 29th hours of service rule set change? We're looking at having a little a little pop-up to, to say, hey, there's new rules, and maybe point to the FMCSA website. But we're also anticipating that everybody knows about this already. It's it, it's getting a, a huge amount of press. So to hopefully carriers and, and drivers have been keeping a close eye on on the whole process. I mean, it's been a two-year-long process with, with the FMCSA. So it, it's looking likely that we can add something just to remind the driver that it's the 29th. But at the same time, I, I think everyone's looking forward to these changes and, and, and probably know that they're going to be there on the 29th. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Kyle. It looks like that is the last question that we have for today's session. So that makes it a wrap for this week's Wildcard Wednesday. Again, a big thank you to Hillary and Kyle for joining us today, sharing these updates and answering all of these questions. If you do have any further questions regarding today's topics, please don't hesitate to reach out to your reseller or your account manager, and we'll make sure that those get answered for you. But with that being said, until next time, I'm Shay Green, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We'll see you guys next time. Same Geotab time, same Geotab channel. Thanks so much, everybody.